If you're listening to this podcast, it's probably because a child you love and care for is differently wired. Are they also struggling in their current educational setting, seen only for what they're doing wrong while longing for positive relationships with peers and others? Envision a world where your child's unique abilities are not just recognized, but celebrated. A world where they can connect with others and their true potential is seen and appreciated. The Strength-Based Assessment Lab's mission is to build a world for your child just like that. Through its innovative approach, it aims to empower students, families, educators, and professionals to create positive, effective, and collaborative learning experiences. Be a part of shaping a brighter future for your child. Visit www.bgs.edu to learn more about what a strength-based assessment could mean for your family. That's bgs.edu. Screen time was an issue that I had so many conversations about and just realized that it was top of mind for most of the parents that I knew. And yet there wasn't that one book that people had, you know, to say like, oh, you have to read this and this will help you figure it out the way there might be for sleep or food or other issues that that parents are grappling with. So I really set out to write that book. I set out to write the the guide that I wish I'd had that was, you know, reassuring and calm and, and based on the evidence, but also had a lot of firsthand on the ground detail about what parents are really doing. Welcome to the Tilt Parenting Podcast, a podcast featuring interviews and conversations aimed at inspiring, informing, and supporting parents raising differently wired kids. I'm your host, Debbie Reber, and today's episode is about a topic that is oh so relevant to parents like us, and that is the topic of screen time. My guest is Anya Kamenitz, a mother of two, writer and digital education correspondent for NPR National Public Radio, and author of the brand new book, The Art of Screen Time, How Your Family Can Balance Digital Media and Real Life. Anya's book looks at the most recent and sometimes inconclusive research regarding screen time and features insight gleaned from surveys of hundreds of fellow parents on their practices and ideas. In our conversation, Anya shares what she learned about kids and screen time, as well as her takeaways on the latest research surrounding screen time and differently wired kids. I can't promise that this episode will end screen time struggles in your home if you have them, but it will give you some food for thought regarding how much is too much, what problematic screen usage looks like, and more. And as a short FYI, if you're curious to know more about how my husband and I handle screen time with Asher, Asher and I have recorded two episodes on the topic, one specifically about our guidelines surrounding screen time and one where Asher shares his thoughts on extreme parenting policies and the idea of banning screens or certain games. To listen to those, visit the podcast page on Tilt Parenting and click on the Asher Specials button. You'll find both of them in there. And before I get to our chat, a quick reminder to grab the new Parenting SOS cheat sheet I put together on Tilt Parenting. I went back through all 50 of my podcast episodes from 2017, and I pulled the 10 most powerful parenting strategies I learned from them and created a downloadable PDF with those strategies that you can print out and stick on your fridge, on your office wall, anywhere you can see it regularly. The mini poster features advice from Dr. Ross Green, author Jessica Leahy, executive functioning coach Seth Perler, and more. And it's designed to offer you quick, helpful strategies. To download that, go to tiltparenting.com slash cheat sheet. And now without further ado, here's my conversation with Anya. I hope you enjoy it. Hey, Anya, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Debbie, thanks for having me. Well, of course, I'm really intrigued about your book and excited to share it with our listeners because screen time is a part of, I know it's a huge part of the world for pretty much everyone in the Tilt Parenting community. I know it's part of every kid's life, but it seems like for differently wired kids, it is um, perhaps a more prominent part of our life where sometimes the struggles can be more intense for us. So I'm excited to just share your findings and um, the comprehensive book that you've put together. So before we get into that, just to kind of set the stage for who you are and and your background, could you tell us a little bit about your work as an education writer and and how you came to write this book? Sure. So I have a longstanding interest in education and technology. I've written, uh, this is my fourth book, and I've written about different aspects of education and particularly how it's evolved. 
I also was a fast company staff writer for five years. And that's where I really kind of covered the cutting edge of innovation and all kinds of technology. And so my passion is for the way that we learn and how, you know, the way we learn is changing over time. And then, of course, I became a parent six years ago and, and got even more interested. It got even more personal for me to think about the changing world that our kids are growing up in and how we as parents can kind of apply the values that don't change to try to uh, do things better. So I, I'm always interested when I hear from people who have been doing this work and then they had children. And I'm just wondering, like, how has your work changed? Generally speaking, not, you know, in relation to this particular book, but in general, now doing your work through the lens of a parent. I mean, I think it just, it, it, it just intensifies how important it is for, you know, each child deserves the best and each child deserves to have, you know, their, their rights upheld and their differences respected. And, you know, having a, a child, you know, two children myself that I would do absolutely anything for, it helps me understand how difficult it is because when we look at something like education, you know, it is a global effort and a global enterprise, um, but it's also very, very personal for, for everyone who's engaged in it. And so trying to think about, you know, dilemmas in education from both of those sides, uh, I think is, is very really enriched the way that I look at the, the issues. Yeah, that makes total sense. Just that when it becomes personal, it, it, it changes. And it's great to have that perspective. So your new book that comes out January 30th is The Art of Screen Time. So how did that particular book come about? And can you tell us a little bit about, you know, not just the impetus, but what you're hoping to do through it? Absolutely. So uh, I literally, I was having lunch with my editor and I took out my phone to look at my Kindle app because my mission was to write a book that I myself would want to read and would want to own. And screen time was an issue that I had so many conversations about and just realized that it was top of mind for most of the parents that I knew. And yet there wasn't that one book that people had you know, to say like, oh, you have to read this and this will help you figure it out the way there might be for sleep or food or other issues that, that parents are grappling with. So I really set out to write that book. I set out to write the the guide that I wish I'd had that was, you know, reassuring and calm and, and based on the evidence, but also had a lot of firsthand on the ground detail about what parents are really doing. Yeah. I mean, it is one of those well, I mean, just and we'll, we'll get into this, but screen time is such a loaded concept and it, it's it's also so broad. I mean, there's video gaming. We have done one episode so far on video gaming with a Dr. Rachel Cowart and we talked about, you know, very specifically gaming and, and what does addiction look like in gaming and that kind of thing. But you're really looking at screen time as a much broader topic here, right? I am. And I think that's because it's it's kind of the way that parents might think about it when they're first starting out, especially with very young children. And so it's kind of the broad end of the funnel, but also realizing that it, it shows up very, very differently for different kids and just different kids have different aspects of media that they gravitate toward. Um, and of course, there are kids who don't you gravitate towards it at all. And then, then they don't really have a problem. But, you know, thinking about it as broadly as possible really kind of helped me to think about what's the taxonomy of screens. Um, what are the different types of behavior with relationship to screens, active versus passive use, interactive, you know, mobile device versus television. And so, um, yeah, really trying to, to, to set as broad a uh, basis as possible, knowing that parents will have their own very individual um, ways into this issue and trying to give people, you know, a, a set of rules, a heuristic rules of thumb for thinking about it instead of a set of, you know, instead of just prescribing it from above. Yeah, I mean, that's what I really appreciated about the book is there's so much information that is contributed by, like, there's a lot of anecdotes from other parents. I know that I identified with different policies, you shared a lot of policies that people have. And then you also, I mean, you're a researcher. So you did the gift of doing research for us and putting it together in a way that we could digest it. Thank you. That's definitely what I set out to do. And I mean, even when you come down to the idea of time, you know, pointing out that not all parents care about time or really would need to regulate time. And, and sometimes you are, you're more interested in priority or you're more interested in the type of activity um, or you're more interested, as I know that you've written about, you know, getting your, your kids to regulate it themselves. And I think that's a really wise approach. Yes. I, I know that as I was reading through it, and I'm curious to know it, how it changed you as a parent or just with your own screen time policies. I mean, I will just say, and my longtime listeners know that we, we don't have a lot of 
screen time strict rules right now because we did for many years and it was it was really taking a toll on our family trying to enforce those rules. And I also recognize that ultimately our kids have to be responsible. They're going to have to learn how to be responsible for regulating their own screen time because we're not going to be there when they're in their 20s, you know, telling them to get off the computer and do their laundry or whatever it is. So for us, I'm trying to play in that space of um, what does that look like and how much do I regulate and how much do I kind of let him figure it out on his own. But, you know, reading your book, I definitely, it makes me think about these things more. Am I making the right choices? Where do I fit into this? And so I'm curious, what were your screen time policies like if you had them before you wrote this book and how have they changed if they did? So in the process of writing this book, you know, my my older daughter went from age three to now age six. And then I had a younger baby as well, who's now 14 months. So, you know, families change and ages change. And I think what's appropriate for kids at different stages is really going to change. Uh, the one rule that's remained a constant in our house is that we do keep the videos off except for Saturdays. So we have one day a week where she can kind of go nuts and watch um pretty much whatever she wants. I mean, we do, you know, even on that day, you know, she has to have a balance with other activities. She has to eat, she has to play outside, you know, eat her breakfast before she sits down to watch. And what's been beautiful as I've seen it evolve with her is that there's a lot of buy-in with her on that policy. So, um, you know, even if she has a play date over or she's at a friend's house or they have different rules, she kind of um, has has internalized the idea that, you know, screens are for certain times and places and they're not for other times. And it's helped her, I think, you know, on other times of the week where she's bored or she, you know, she would have that feeling of discomfort that would cause us to turn to a screen um, and she's able to manage it and work um, work on different things instead. And she's become a big reader over the last few years. So that's that's been great. I mean, the, the iPad has come in in a slightly different way. We've in, we introduced it with passes. So she was a little bit older, around age four. And there's different kinds of, um, you know, apps that, that are approved by us. And then she has three 20-minute passes a week, which she can use for, you know, and it's her decision of when to use them, basically. And so that's been really helpful as well, because it's, it's a little bit of an older kid approach where instead of us just dictating yes or no, she gets to think about, well, is it something I want to do now? I may not get to do it later. Um, and then we do also have loopholes for car rides and sick days and vacations, which are both pretty, all pretty clear to us. So. Yeah, so that's been the policy for now. I mean, I know that we're just a few years out from the beginnings of social media, texting with her friends and getting her own phone, perhaps, especially in New York City, you have kids who are, you know, out um, out and about a little bit. So we're we're kind of working on setting the, the ground floor, the boundaries now and, and opening up the conversation to hopefully have a, a healthier relationship. But, you know, the key thing, too, that I also write about in the book is it's also really about us as role models. And that's where I feel like I have continuous work to do. And so does my husband. Uh, and we're starting to hear from our daughter about, you know, your phone's, is, your phone's out at the table or, um, you know, my younger daughter, the baby, grabbing my phone whenever it's out, um, which is actually a great check on me to put it away. Um, so she'll take it and she'll run across the room with it. <laughs> so, you know, it really is a dynamic process. And um, but trying to be aware of the fact that our behavior is exactly what they're going to be modeling. Ah, uh, yes. The power of modeling behavior, that, that is a... A big power that we wield and something I think about a lot. And, you know, there was something I read in your book I thought was really interesting around that. You talked about the still face experiments. Can you oh, yeah. explain that? I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, this has been uh, very uh, big in my imagination since I saw it. So this is the the work of Edward Tronick at the University of Massachusetts. And he was looking at the impact of perhaps a uh, uh, maternal depression, particularly postpartum depression. And so he did these lab experiments where you have a four-month-old baby and all that happens is that the mother has a face that doesn't respond. So the baby is interacting and trying to clap and giggle and get the mom's attention. And the mother just isn't responding, isn't responding. And it leads to very high stress response in a really short period of time. Then the kid kind of, you know, collapses in tears and gets very stressed and seems to remember it later. And what does this tell us? How transferable is this? Um, I think we really don't know. We're really just at the beginning of research on parental distraction and, you know, whether or not the the ubiquity of this, these um, incredibly compulsive and compelling devices is actually leading to less contact time and less talking and less interaction um, and less emotional responsiveness between parents and babies. I mean, I've spotted many, you know, moms and dads and caregivers with you know, on their phones and the kids are in the strollers. 
Um, and it's not to say that you need to have, you know, 24 seven eye lock onto your kid. That's not realistic and it's not help, helpful or healthy. Uh, but the point is, is it stealing your focus when you don't mean it to be, you know, is it taking you away from your kid and being as responsive to those little cues that are the beginnings of language development and emotional development. And I think it's something that, um, you know, we're going to be hearing more about in years to come. Yeah. I thought that was really fascinating. It's, it is just something I think about. I'm pretty good about keeping the phone away when, when, you know, just like you're sitting at a restaurant waiting for your food to come. It's just such a natural tendency that I, you know, to pull out and my husband will do it. And I'll just look at him and say, Oh, what are you doing? And it'll quickly, you know, put it back in his pocket, but it, it becomes this knee jerk reaction. And uh, it, it is something I think we have to work hard to be conscious about not doing because our kids. Yeah, we're modeling every time we do that. We'll be right back after this quick break. Darren and I are prepping for a big move at the moment, so we are fully leaning into any and everything that simplifies things, and that absolutely includes mealtimes. At a time when my executive functioning skills are being pushed to the limit, even planning and executing dinner for our family these days can feel like a really big lift. That's why I'm especially grateful for Green Chef, a meal service that offers pre-measured and prepped ingredients to my door. Each box is packed with foods you can feel good about, like whole fruits and vegetables, plus lean protein and whole grain options. In fact, one of the things I love most about Green Chef is that they offer options that prioritize gut and brain health, with science-backed recipes that feature ingredients like fiber, antioxidants, and omega-3 fatty acids. During this time of lots of stress, it feels really grounding to know we're supporting ourselves nutritionally. I will take all the support I can get. And Green Chef doesn't just cover dinner recipes. I can add high quality breakfasts, lunches, and snacks to my weekly box from Green Market. Green Chef has a special offer for Tilt listeners. Go to greenchef.com slash tilt50 and use code tilt50 to get 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's 50% off plus 20% off your next two months when you use the code TILT50 at greenchef.com slash TILT50. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. Maybe I've watched too many seasons of The Amazing Race, but every time I have to go somewhere on the subway, I treat it like a competition. It's all about making the right gut decisions about which route will get me there the fastest. Sometimes those decisions get me where I'm going early, and other times my gambles don't really pay off. Probiotics can't help with most gut decisions, but if your gut needs a little support, Ritual has your back. Their Symbiotic Plus, a three-in-one supplement, has clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic to support a balanced gut microbiome. I've been using Symbiotic Plus for about six months now, and it's become a core part of my morning routine. I take the mini capsule every morning while making my way through my inbox, whether I'm at home or I'm on the road, because it doesn't need to be refrigerated. And the capsule itself is delayed released, which helps it survive the harsh conditions of the upper GI tract for delivery to the colon. And that's exactly where we want it to go. Ritual invested in a study modeling the human colon, which showed that Symbiotic Plus significantly increased microbial diversity and the growth of beneficial bacteria. There's no more shame in your gut game. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. Get 25% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash tilt. Start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash tilt for 25% off. Well, if you know what's helpful for me is, is something that my friend Dana Boyd, who's a social media expert, uh, suggested. And that is when you pick up your phone around your kids, simply to narrate what it is that you're going to do. So if you say, hey, let's check the weather, or I'm wondering if dad has come home from work, I'm going to send him a text. And making that transparent, I think is a really wonderful way to hold yourself accountable and to, un- and to help the the kids understand what it is that you're doing um, in the same time. So you're not going to pick up your phone around a kid and say, oh, I want to see what Rihanna is up to on Instagram. Right. Like, that's, <laughs> that's not what you're going to say, even if that's what you were going to do. Yeah. And instead of it checks you on the mindlessness of it. And then the thing is, if you're both waiting in a restaurant, you can pick up your phone and say, hey, do you want to look up more of those videos of, of Iceland that we were talking about? Or remember, you had that question about geothermal energy. Let's see if we can find out the answer. And then the phone becomes, you know, it can become a catalyst you can be killing time on your phone with your kids. And then it's a joint effort instead of, 
you know, and you can also always play I Spy or do any of the other million things that we do to kill time together. But, um, you know, but the phone can be part of that as long as you're using it to connect. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. I like that. I want to just hear from you on different types of media and just, I know that all media is not created equal. And that's something, mm-hmm. again, I think a lot about, you know, my son, I homeschool him, but he does a lot of classes virtually. He's designing a font right now. So he spends a lot of time in Adobe Illustrator. And I don't count that the same as passively watching a YouTube video or something. But I'm wondering what you found in terms of how, you know, is there a difference between different types of media that you found in your research in terms of how they impact kids? The answer to that broadly is yes. Researchers have a lot of trouble discriminating because they don't do that. Just the pace of scientific evidence is behind the pace of the text. Right. Um, so when you look at something that talks about smartphone compulsion or compulsive use, they're not necessarily breaking down exactly what people are doing. I mean, there's there's a little bit of a difference looking at Internet you know, video gaming versus just Internet use in general. But, for example, I mean, Dimitri Christakis, the, who's in the American Academy of Pediatrics, he kind of suspects that interactive media use is better for your kids because it's more like a toy. It's learning cause and effect. And then Victoria Dunkley, who wrote the book on screen time detox, she's in the opposite camp. She thinks the games are really dangerous because they're so compelling and they lead to dopamine surges in the brain and and that, you know, a slow paced television show is a lot less dangerous, essentially. Um, And then the people in sort of the camp of positive parenting with technology, they're all about moving your your use to something that's more creative, expressive, um, and the kind of work that your son is doing online would certainly fall into that camp. So, I mean, I don't mean to muddy the waters, but the point is there's a universe of tech out there. I think we kind of, we don't have the hard evidence that we have to use our common sense and think, okay, what do we observe in our children after a four-hour television marathon on YouTube versus Minecraft or a game they really love versus actually working on something and creating something themselves? You know, do they, are they energized? Are they sapped? Are they in a bad mood? Are they in a good mood? Are they excited to do more? Are they excited to do something else? And so, you know, we have to kind of use our common sense in a way and and also look at the impact on ourselves and think about it. You know, when I'm doing something kind of hard but fun online, it's not something, you know, if I slip into flow state, that's fantastic. But normally, it's not going to just, the hours aren't just going to fly by the way they might if I'm, you know, aimlessly scrolling and checking Pinterest. Right. And that's not going to be such a great use of my time. Yeah. So all of these factors together, and that's why a combination of, um Parental feedback, let's say, an authoritative intervention, mediation. We're not we're not dictating what they do. We're not we're not dictating it fully on time. I mean, you know, your kid could be looking at porn for 15 minutes a day. It doesn't matter that it's only 15 minutes. It's still harmful. So, you know, so so thinking about those different factors together, and that's why I kind of think about, you know, your balanced media diet and kinds of different uses of media. Yeah. Can you explain? You use that metaphor throughout the book. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. So I borrow the term from Michael Pollan, the food writer, um, and I talk about enjoy screens, not too much, mostly together. Um, And the enjoyment is really important because I think that our use of screens, um, you know, we all use media because we all get a ton out of media. You know, this this podcast is an example of that. Um, We use it to work. We use it to be creative. We use it to learn about the world around us and to connect with others. And so modeling that enjoyment with our kids and thinking of media as something something that you do together are super important components of this. It can't just be fear-based and it can't just be based on the negatives or or the dangers. At the same time, you know, not too much. There is such a thing as too much, even of a good thing. And so figuring out how to balance screens and media related activities with activities that are offline, especially spending time with, you know, the people in our lives that we spend hopefully the most time with our families, um, as well as playing outside and being physical, um, that all goes into the policies as well. So I think that the healthy diet metaphor plays into that, you know, it's possible to have too much, even healthy food. You want to get your kids involved together in preparing meals, just as you want to get them involved with you with using media. And you want to enjoy yourself because we're not, you know, we we're here on this planet to enjoy ourselves. And um, just like we're eating, not every bite has to be broccoli and steamed fish. I mean, there's there's a role for lots of things in a healthy diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So, just because knowing the audience for for the Tilt Parenting podcast, we're raising differently wired kids, which I use to define any sort of neuroatypical development, which could be anything from ADHD to autism to giftedness to dyslexia. You know, it's kind of across the board. I'm curious to know what you 
you know, I know you talk about autism and some other things in your book. Did you learn anything specifically that would have, you know, be important for our audience to know as it relates to screens and our kids? Yes, I did. So media effects researchers are developing a theory of what they call orchid and dandelion children. And I know orchid children is also a phrase that people use in the in the neurotypical community. But basically what they're saying is we see small but real effects across the population when it comes to the to media exposure. Um, and their theory is that there are certain kids who are more susceptible to the effects of media. And, um, and, and they name, you know, kids on the autism spectrum, uh, kids with attention deficit issues, and also certain kinds of emotional volatility. So kids that are rated by their parents as being harder to calm and self-regulate as infants at the age of nine months, they end up being watching more television at the age of two. And there seems to be a double feedback loop that goes on there. Um, so one is that they're more fussy to begin with and the parents are turning to screens to get a break. It also could be that the screens seem to be calming them down, but actually it's a, it's a form of stimulation. Um, so, you, you know, we can all kind of see this paradoxical effect when it comes to media. You know, if you have a kid who's kind of intense emotionally, and they're very attached to their screen, and the screen seems to be pacifying them or chilling them out. But then when you turn it off, you get this explosive reaction, um, because they're so attached to what's happening. And so, uh, you know, this is exactly the population of, of kids that may be more prone to problematic relationships with screens, being really attached to their screens, having a restricted interest in something that might be like a media, a particular media set of characters, or even a particular game. And so this is exactly the population that people think about when they think about just monitoring really closely and making sure that you're not seeing too many issues. And then the other interesting interaction they have to throw in there is a relationship between screens and sleep, because we all know how important it is to have good, solid sleep for kids whose brains are developing. And especially when you have kids who might be more emotionally volatile, that if they, if they miss out on sleep, it makes it even harder for them to withstand frustration and to tolerate changes in their routine. And the screen time can sometimes sneak in there and you say, well, they're not, you know, as a young child, they're not taking a nap, but at least they'll sit and watch a show instead, or, you know, they watch their favorite show before bed or whatever. And that's an area that, um, that researchers look at sleep are very concerned that parents, you know, they might see a really, what looks like a really serious problem, but it might be, you know, the lack of sleep might be driving it Mm -hmm. and screens in turn might be driving that. Right. Gosh, it's so complicated. You know, as as you're talking about kids who have trouble with that transition, you know, when Asher was maybe three, four, five, and he was watching, gosh, I don't, there was a show on Disney that he, maybe Little Einsteins, does that sound right? Anyway, he loved that show, but it was when the show was over, right? And I hear that from a lot of parents in our community, that it's that transition, the ending of something that yes. created so much just upset in the child. And, and it always was a double edged sword for us, because it also could in the moment appear to be a regulating activity. And we never knew what to do. So we'd go, well, that's it, no more TV, period. And then, you know, we went through a few months like that. And then we tried introducing things in different ways. But it is, you know, I know for a lot of kids on the autism spectrum, too, screen stuff can be really regulating for them. Um, It's a world they have control in, you know, if they're playing a game, it's a way for them to socially engage in a way that they might not be able to with their peers in school. And so I find it such a tricky thing to kind of figure out what is best for kids when it appears that it is an activity that actually can help them regulate and maybe it changes as they mature. I don't know. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, you know, I, I want to honor that that's really complicated and hard, and I don't have a child on the spectrum. Um, I do want to say that, I mean, some experts have suggested the idea of, of starting a timer, right, and giving a five-minute warning to help with the transition, and that can help with lots of transitions. Um, I also want to use the analogy that, you know, I used M&Ms to help my child use the potty, and, and that was, a, you know, a small-scale example of bribery that worked really well. It doesn't mean that she needs M&Ms now to use the potty. But if, if there's a way to incentivize an easier transition, you know, it, it's a really, really important skill, right, in emotional mm-hmm. regulation. And when my daughter was the age of two, she would whine and cry when we turned off the cartoons. And I said two things to her. One was, 
before we turn this on, let's make a decision about what we're going to do later that you're excited about. Are we going to go to the park? Are we going to have a snack? Are we going to call a friend? You know, so after the show, which you're so excited about, we're going to do this. And then when you're turning it off, you remind her, hey, remember we said we were going to do this great thing. And that was really helpful. And then that was the carrot. And then the stick was, if you get really upset when we turn off My Little Pony, then we're not going to have it next time. Right. That can be good motivation for some kids, for sure. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it doesn't work for everyone because, you know, but the, it's really interesting because it's like, well, they're having an emotional reaction, which they may, may not be in control of at the, in the moment. And we all have that experience of being overwhelmed by emotion sometimes. At the same time, what is the incentive for them to develop that scaffolding to self-regulate over time? Maybe it's too much and they can't have it. Or, you know, maybe after three hours of it, they're, they're, out, they're depleted and they can't, they can't pick it back up and you, you need to just, you know, you need to just limit it to 30 minutes. And after 30 minutes, they're, they're just fine. They can bounce back. Or maybe they need to take a break in the middle. But playing around with that, there's, there's, there's options other than the binary. Yes, you have it or no, you don't have it. Mm-hmm. We'll be right back after this quick break. Hey there, it's Debbie. I love making this show and sharing conversations about how to support our awesome neurodivergent kids. I've seen how even one little insight from an interview can spark a big shift in daily life. But I know that raising complex kids can be messy and lonely. And just when we think we figured it out, something comes up that boots us right back to feeling overwhelmed and stuck. That's why I've poured everything into creating a way for parents like us navigating complex parenting journeys to join together and chart a path that feels positive, hopeful, and doable. It's the brand new Differently Wired Club experience. In the club, you'll get personal support from me and other seasoned parent coaches, six live calls every month where you can connect and get your personal questions answered, the opportunity to learn directly from authors and experts like I have on this show, monthly themes for getting specific and tactical, an exclusive private podcast feed, and the best, most generous community of parents. Seriously, these folks show up for themselves and each other, and that right there is really everything. Because it's a daily reminder that we're not alone. Our kids aren't broken, and we have totally got this. The recently rebooted Differently Wired Club is on a brand new platform with its very own iOS and Android app. It is such a great space. However you learn, whatever your style, no matter the ages, genders, and neurodivergent profile of your children, the Differently Wired Club can help you cultivate the positive shifts you're hoping for. Join us today by going to tiltparenting.com slash club. That's tiltparenting.com slash club. I hope to see you on the inside. Lynn, this time of year, parenting can be such a fluster clucks. You've come to the right place. I'm Lynn Lyons, and I've been treating anxious families for over 30 years. I'm Lynn's sister-in-law and co-host Robin Hudson. Join us for Fluster Clucks, a podcast for parents who worry. Wait, that's everybody. Yeah, these last few years have felt like one long anxiety attack for so many. Why do you think parents are always surprised that a podcast about anxiety relates to them even if no one in their house has an anxiety disorder? Well, worry is human, everyone does it, and anxiety shows up when we face uncertainty. All the parenting tips you've taught me have been essential. I love to break it down into skills we need to manage worry in our families. We've covered so many topics depression, burnout, meltdowns, perfectionism. Don't forget scary mothers-in-law. Right, but of course that's not my mother-in-law. Because that's my mother. And a listener. As a psychotherapist, I like to teach parents and kids how to respond to everyday moments in healthy ways. Managing anxiety really can be taught. It really can. And I'll even tell you what to say. We talk about serious stuff, but without being too serious. Anxiety wants everything serious. Anxiety doesn't stand a chance when we're laughing, even about the tough stuff. You know, it changes, right? I know that as kids develop and and mature, you know, what worked at one age is may stop working and um and their ability to regulate their transitions will change. You know, one of the things that we do now that tends to work pretty well is just before the screen goes on, you know, what's your plan? You know, what's your plan for getting off? How are you going to respond when I say we're having dinner in 15 minutes? What are you going to be doing? Is that going to be easy to turn off? How are you know, there's a lot of prep work that goes before he is able to go on. And that has has helped because again, ultimately, I want him to be intrinsically motivated and and develop those skills on his own. But it's a work in progress, (laughs) for sure. 
That's amazing, though. I mean, that's the hard work, but that's what's going to serve him the rest of his life, right? If he has those skills. Right. That's the plan. That's the plan. Um, You mentioned a problematic relationship with technology. And I just would love to know how you define that. Like, what constitutes a problematic relationship with screens? Well, this is something that scientists are working on right now because there's a, there's a live ongoing debate about whether we use the term addiction. But uh, a, a paper just came out that surveyed about 20,000 parents and looked at um, the, the problematic media use scale. And they had adopted that from Internet Gaming Disorder, which is already listed as a, a an object of study in the current diagnostic and statistical manual. So it's pretty common sense. It's sort of like, it's questions like, is this my child's favorite activity? Is it the only thing that makes them feel good sometimes? Do they get upset when it's turned off? Do they sneak around to use it? Do they seem to be um, needing more and more of it to have a good time? And of course, common sense, right? Is it causing problems in your family, in your, in school or with friends and with other, and are they losing interest in other activities? Mm -hmm. Um, so you can find the entire thing online, the problematic media use measure, and they're just trying to do the work of correlating those answers with, you know, real world problems that are observable by other means in children's lives. Mm, okay, great. Thank you. This is such a new science, right? It's such a new area of study and, and it's going to continue to evolve because technology is evolving so fast. How do you even keep up with it? Yes. Yes, this is a huge problem that all the researchers I talk to are, are talking about. I mean, you know, papers are being published now that have to do with PCs and iPads and, you know, previous versions of the iPad. Um, the, you know, sometimes they study real apps, but sometimes they build apps for study in the, in the lab and they just don't really resemble the apps that kids are really using. Um, you know, there's no research out on VR yet, uh, not to mention Alexa or the interactive AI machines and nothing that I've seen that really looks at the, the, the real world implications of having a talking computer in your house. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's tricky. Yeah, I bet it was tricky as you were researching the book too, because there are probably new studies coming out, right? When you think you finished the first draft or yes. something. <laughs> Huge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um before we go two quick questions one you know i'm just wondering i i'm curious were there any kind of big surprises as you were writing this book something that you weren't expecting to discover um i think the hmm, i mean the research on sleep is the part that i always talk about because it just it had been there in the background i knew there was stuff about blue light but i didn't realize it was so re well established how it can impact sleep. And I didn't, I didn't realize how the impact on sleep can have so many other effects, whether it's on weight or on mood or on learning. Mm. Um, so I, yeah, I became a little bit of a, of a, you know, no devices in the bedroom zealot after that. Yeah. What can, just for listeners, can you tell us what specifically would be some good guidelines around screen as it relates to sleeping? Like, is there a minimum time that you or maximum time you should have between end of screens and sleep bedtime? Yeah, generally sleep researchers would say no devices, no devices in the bedroom and none, none as part of the bedtime routine and maybe none for, um, you know, up to an hour before bedtime if you can. Okay, good. Whew. All right. I passed that test. Good. Um, <laughs> and then lastly, can you tell us where listeners can find you online and where they can get your book, The Art of Screen Time? Yes. The, the Art of Screen Time is available wherever books are sold. Um, I'm coming to the West Coast for a book tour. I'll also be in Chicago. And you can find all the details at anyakamenetz.net. My first name is spelled A-N-Y-A. -A. Last name is K-A, M as in Mary, E. And as a Nancy, ETZ. So on your camera, that's on that. Perfect. And are you active on social media as well? Or I'm on Twitter at Anya One Anya. You can also find me on at NPR, npr.org slash ed is our blog. Awesome. Okay. And listeners, I will include links to all of the resources and Anya's book and her social media and, and website on the show notes page. So you can look at that more in depthly. And Anya, thank you so much for this conversation. Super interesting. And congratulations again on the book. And I hope it does really well for you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the chance to get it out to your listeners. You've been listening to the Tilt Parenting Podcast. For the show notes for this episode, including links to Anya's website, her new book, The Art of Screen Time, and the other resources we discussed, visit tiltparenting.com slash session 95. 
If you like what you heard on today's episode, I would be grateful if you could take a minute to head over to iTunes and leave a rating or review. We're still in the new and noteworthy category in kids and family. And honestly, it's just so exciting to see this audience grow and the podcast continue to get great attention. And it makes it a lot easier for me to land those big guests. So it's a win-win. Thank you so much for being a part of making that happen. Lastly, if you aren't already part of the online community at Tilled, I invite you to join us. Each Thursday, I send out a short email with a quick note from me, a link to that week's podcast episode, and links to five stories from the news that week that are relevant to parents like us. You can sign up for that on the Tilt Parenting website. Thanks again for listening. For more information on Tilt Parenting, visit www.tiltparenting.com. If you're a parent, I invite you to join us at the Mindful Mama podcast, where it's all about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. With sometimes hilarious and always thought-provoking experts and friends, at Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm Hunter Clark-Fields, and I can't wait to see you there. Listen in to the Mindful Mama podcast.